Well, welcome, uh, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for our first uh, seminar uh, of this year, uh, Legal Philosophy Between State and Transnationalism. Uh, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker today, uh, Professor Ingo Vetsky is joining us from University of Amsterdam, the Faculty of Law, uh, where he is also the uh, 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 Executive Director of the Amsterdam Center for International Law, uh, which I think is a recent, yes. recent appointment. Yeah. Right. Uh, by way of background, uh, Ingo has been a visiting professor at the Jindal Global Law School, uh, as well as a vis visiting senior fellow at the National Univers University of Singapore. Uh, a Hauser Research Scholar at New York University, and a visiting scholar at the Segla Center for Interdisciplinary Research of Law at Tel Aviv University. Uh, he completed his uh, doctorate at the University of Frankfurt, uh, during uh, which time he was also a research fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law in Heidelberg. Uh, he is also the editor-in-chief uh, for the Leiden uh, Journal of International Law. Uh, Ingo's research focuses mainly on questions about uh, the roles that international courts play in global governance, uh, and in particular, uh, he examines how they can test and accommodate authority in a normative uh, pluriverse. He's published several articles in main journals in transnational law uh, international Law and Comparative Law, and his book, uh, 2012, with uh, Oxford University Press, How Interpretation Makes International Law Possible on Semantic Change and Normative Twists, uh, is also the winner of the 2014 Book Prize uh, of the European Society for International Law. Uh, so it's my great uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Venske with us today, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. The more the merrier. Uh, welcome. Uh, oh, happy that there are more speakers. Well, thank you so much, uh, Michael. Um, it's a great pleasure also and honor to, to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation and the honor to open this season of seminars on state and transnationalism. Um, and already in advance, thanks to Francois for his uh, comments and for you all for coming and for chiming in. So I take it that it hardly raises an eyebrow anymore and probably passes as pretty received wisdom that foreign companies can bring claims against host states. So foreign investors can bring claims directly before international arbitral tribunals against host states challenging host states' actions under a bilateral investment treaty. So I think as lawyers, we have many reasons at hand on how that's possible, how that has happened, why that's possible. We rationalize it, we make sense of it, and we can easily tell the story of how it's come about that foreign companies have that capacity, what the law is, that sustains this way of action. So what might have come at quite a surprise maybe in the past hardly raises an eyebrow in the present. So the developments, the steps that were taken that have led to this state of affairs, I suggest um, might have been somewhat surprising at the time but are hardly surprising any longer. And that is partially due to the fact, well, how we, um, not partially, it's mostly <laughs> about the, the effect of how we remember these events, how we treat them, how we also teach them, usually as events that are forward-looking, path-breaking, seminal, that fit in with the development whose outcome we are well aware of. So just to give you um, two examples of this development towards the state of affairs where foreign direct investors can bring claims directly before an arbitral tribunal against host states, two events that have um, led the path towards this development. Uh, 
One is a 1977 arbitral decision by a single arbitrator in the so-called Texaco award, Texaco case against Libya um, that is typical of the time uh, in which the single arbitrator Dupuy decided that the foreign company Texaco could bring a claim against Libya's nationalization measures on the basis of a concession contract only. So that this concession contract or the deed of concession is a so-called internationalized contract and by way of its internationalization it involves a foreign company and a host state. It is governed and subject to international law. And it is this contract that provided foreign investors an avenue towards international arbitration. It's one seminal case that uh, leads this way towards this present state of affairs. Another one, um, a bit more than two decades later, is um, the so-called AAPL versus Sri Lanka award that for the first time held that a foreign direct investor can hold a host state to that host state's commitments in an international treaty. So not commitments that it had made in a contract, but commitments that the host state had made in an international treaty with the state of nationality of that uh, foreign investor. And this is the model that we are now, at least as international investment lawyers, but not only are quite accustomed and familiar with the basis that the international uh, or the, the scenario that an international treaty between two states provides the basis for a foreign direct investor to bring a claim and challenge um, a host state's measure under that international treaty. And I'm just keeping track of time. And also there, legal doctrine and thinking has been quick to rationalize and make sense of this development, to make it fit within a doctrine to, yeah, to make sense of it, in this case, by developing a theory of arbitration without privity. So whereas usually for any arbitration um, to kick off, to take off the ground, you need some agreement between the parties, you don't have that in this constellation. Or the theory would suggest you have it, it's just in different instruments. You have the story goes, a bilateral investment treaty in which the states create a standing offer to arbitrate and then the foreign company by filing a notice of arbitration accepts that offer and thereby creates the, um, the agreement or the uh, consent by both parties. But that is very much an ex post rationalization of what has happened. So while it is crystal clear to us, or at least to many in the national investment lawyers, why these decisions were made in the way they were made, they feed doctrine and legal thinking that makes sense of them and rationalizes, that, rationalizes them. They fit the doctrine of internationalized contracts in the first case and the doctrine of arbitration without privity in the second. Now I think if pushed, uh, we readily see and concede <coughs> that none of this was necessary. Of course these decisions could have gone the other way. Yeah, like many at the time actually did. So maybe we remember that next to Texaco there were others that decided exactly the opposite. Or next to APPL uh, Sri Lanka there were others before and they decided the opposite and afterwards they also decided the opposite. But my point is and that's my proposition is that legal thinking and the number of dynamics that sustain legal thinking and legal memory maybe uh, makes us forget that it could have been otherwise. Legal thinking gives too much credit to what has happened, it rationalizes and solidifies what has happened. And what is more by solidifying what has happened, it stands in the way of change. So it's a solidified reality is diff more difficult to change than a reality that is visi that visibly could have also been otherwise. So it stands in the way of change. And that's critical because well, no matter which political color or standing you might have, the picture of international law is pretty bleak. So at the moment it's um, a matter of fact that uh, the richest 20% hold 80% of all wealth and consume no, 94% of all wealth. The richest 20% hold 94% of all wealth and consume 
of all resources. That's not in spite of international law, but in large part due to international law. So international law redistributes gains, uh, it redistributes um, uh, resources and entitlements. So th I think there's a need for change and the, in a way, naturalizing gloss that legal thinking and memory gives to past developments stands in the way of such change. So to counter that tendency of international legal thinking to solidify what has in fact happened and to thereby harden the possibilities for change, I wish to regain senses of possibilities in the past to learn again what, or to learn for the first time perhaps, what else could plausibly have happened. So for example, where could the development of international investment law, to continue with the opening example, have taken different turns? Not only what if the decisions had been decided otherwise, yeah, well, we're all, I don't know, I don't want to presume, but a lot of us would be legal realist enough to think, well, of course, you know, in principle, they could have gone the other way, but also to understand under which conditions they could have gone the other way and would have made a difference in another direction. All connecting to not decisions at all, but to development of the field. What if the International Trade Organization, the statute of that organization had not landed in the dustbins of history as it did around yeah, the four, in the late 40s, but the organization had been set up maybe around 1949. And there are many indicators that suggest that maybe that was not so unlikely. And what difference would that have made? So the interest is to regain a sense of possibilities of the past. And that's maybe in first instance a historical interest. And it corresponds to quite some historians' sensibilities as I, as I see it. So there's a, a German historian called Thomas Nippardai who wrote of the historian's noble dream to give back um, the open future to the past. I quote him, so he, he describes the historian's task uh, as, quote, the noble dream of historians is to understand the past out of its possibilities. Every past has an open future that we as historians need to reinstate, end of quote. And there are others who strike similar tones. There's uh, Patrick Boucheron, who in his uh, recent um, inaugural uh, speech at the Collège de France said uh, very similar things, that uh, it is one of the main contributions of historiography that it may reinstate the futures that were never realized. And more fundamentally, maybe one could also say with Robert Musil that if we want to understand what has actually happened, we want to understand a sense of reality, a Wirklichkeitssinn, we must have a sense of what was possible, a Möglichkeitssinn. We have to have a sense of possibility. So to regain and perhaps yeah, so gain for the first time a sense of possibility, that's what I wish to do by drawing out plausible counterfactuals. So I'm arguing in favor of a practice of writing counterfactual histories and stories of international law. What does that mean? So I'd, connecting to the example, it, counterfactual histories deliberately change an element of reality and antecedent. You know? So they change um, the past in the sense, well, it um, investigates the establishment of the international trade organization, well, knowing well uh, enough that it was never set up. So the, here it's different uh, when compared to something else that has gained traction, at least in international law, that is the writing of counter-narratives. So you write history in a way against the grain or different to perceived, uh, received wisdom. So a standard example of counterfactual history writing and analysis is the uh, um, outbreak of the First World War and the uh, assassination of the uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand and the question of what would have happened had Franz Ferdinand not been assassinated in Sarajevo. Uh, 
So a counterfactual can plausibly change this constellation, uh, which was actually quite accidental. So he took a wrong turn and I mean, the, the chances that the assassination would succeed uh, was actually quite, uh, quite low, but uh, actually it was quite uh, by chance that he was assassinated. Um, so a counterfactual can bring him back to life. A counter-narrative can write a lot of different things about the outbreak of the First World War, but it can't bring him back to life. So that's the nature of, of counterfactual thinking. So I would like to proceed by further supporting why such way of thinking might be fruitful, what is uh, to be gained from it, then to say a few words about how to do it, what are some of the um, uh, questions, um, also difficulties, there are quite a few I must, uh, I must admit, in doing this kind of things, uh, thing, thing, and uh, then to, um, yeah, so to, to first say, why do it, then how to do it, talk some of the, about some of the dangers and problems, but also to first uh, maybe add a note on uh, where I'm coming from, how I, how I got here, if, if that's all right. Okay, so it's actually all started, right, I shouldn't say that. If, if, you know, if you lean back and say it's all started, you know, probably you know, people, people do the same and, uh, and start snoozing away. So uh, let me, let me uh, phrase it differently. Uh, there's a wonderful book that uh, Niklas Luhmann wrote only two years ago. Well, now everybody's awake again because they say, oh, how did that happen? Didn't he pass away a couple of uh, uh, years ago? Yeah, but he did. But there are a lot of people in uh, Bielefeld where he spent his uh, productive life that, they, that think that they are reincarnated uh, Luhmannians. And uh, they draw all uh, pieces and bits together that he has ever written. And so Luhmann continues publishing about a book a year. So two years ago, he published a book uh, called um, Contingenz und Recht, uh, Contingency and Law, um, out of manuscripts, texts uh, that he wrote in the 70s. And uh, it's, it's a great book. Um, hopefully it's been translated by now. I haven't, I haven't checked. But um, in this book, uh, and the introduction notes, I mean, it's, it's a fantastic book and the only reason why he didn't publish this thing before because he had actually published it in some obscure Brazilian uh, journal that nobody knows about. Um, and it introduces this central concept of contingency. So even if you don't know, if you know one, if you don't know anything about systems theory, then know one thing that the concept of contingency is probably the most fundamental concept for the whole body of the theory of systems. So in that piece, he introduces the concept of contingency. I'm not engaging with his theorizing, which would be the next point where people might start to snooze. But I do wish to sketch that notion of contingency because it provides the theoretical backdrop for counterfactual thinking. It supports counterfactual thinking as a meaningful enterprise. And it also comes with a um, little snide against uh, lawyers, not only international lawyers, lawyers generally. Because in this book, Luhmann says that there's a defining characteristic of modernity. And he likes big statements. Huh? So this defining characteristic of modernity is expressed in a shift from having to make sense of contingencies in a world that is actually structured and regulated or regular due to divine will and destiny. So in a pre-modern way of thinking, the task was to make sense of choice and contingency in a world that is in principle determined by destiny and divine will. So now the shift towards modernity is the reverse. So now we have to make sense under modern kind of conditions of regularities. How come things are regular in a world that is in principle contingent? And this is what, in Luhmann's terms, defines the shift in modernity in all sciences. And all sciences have made that shift to now being, to now struggling with accounting for regularity in a world that is in principle contingent, except law. Law still, he says, struggles with uh, 
choice and contingency in a world that it thinks is somehow governed by destiny and divine will. Of course, no variation of divine will. So that was in the 1970s. I don't think that's true anymore. I think a lot has changed since, but I was struck by that. Uh, so I was struck by, actually, I, it, it talked to me and I think, I, it's not true entirely, but I'm struggling. So I've never thought about how international law or law could be different. I'm always trained to um, make sense of choice. Whereas the law you know, wants to be regular. Regularity is the default position. You still have to account for choice rather than the modern way of accounting for regularity in a way that isn't principle contingent. So that uh, struck me. No? And it invited me to uh, think further as to how uh, international law could have been otherwise and how counterfactual histories might make that visible. So again, without delving much more into Luhmann's theory and thinking, I do want to stress that his conception of contingency does not mean randomness, accidents, arbitrariness. <coughs> it does not suggest that law, I talk about international law, could have taken any other shape with equal probability, but it demands thinking in terms of probabilities, but not uh, demand that everything was equally probable or even equally possible. And I, and I stress this, I hasten, uh, I hasten to add this, hasten, uh, to add this because uh, there's a wonderful article by, by Susan Marks called False Contingency, in which she uh, nicely argues uh, makes a compelling argument against placing too much emphasis on choice and contingency, which would uh, make us forget uh, determining factors and forces, contextual constraints that in the end lead to one outcome rather than another. But the reminder that Luhmann uh, uh, articulated for me was, and that's also another way of putting it, a way he also puts it, is that contingency is a claim about the modality of events. And the modality namely does not change with one possibility becoming real. It remains a possibility and notably not a necessity even though it has become real. So the possible remains possible and notably not necessary even though it has become real. That's the claim that contingency makes. And it is via this avenue that I then read up on the quite rich literature, exciting literature, on counterfactual histories, counterfactual thinking in the field of history, but also a bit more popular uh, literature of, uh, in the, in the uh, realm of novels. So maybe just uh, one quick example that is perhaps particularly relevant with regard to what's happening uh, south of your a border, uh, there's uh, actually, I don't know, if, I haven't seen it invoked in the recent debates about the presidential uh, elections, but uh, it must be kind of a uh, top read at the moment. It's uh, Philip Roth's uh, Plot Against America, in which he, he, he opens the novel with a double counterfactual, inviting us to imagine what would have happened had Franklin Roosevelt won the elections in 1940 against Charles Lindbergh, which of course he did, uh, but in this book he didn't, he lost. Charles Lindbergh becomes a president and there's this um, uh, anti-Semitic and uh, racist um, social movement uh, under his presidency and uh, it's, it's a strong counterfactual um, starting, doubly counterfactual starting point and then he tells a singly counterfactual uh, story. Um, the more serious, well it's, it's, it's a serious book but I mean the more scholarly uh, enterprise in the his historiography also started off with a fictional counterfactual, namely, uh, namely Victor Hugo's um, chapter in Les Miserables, in which he imagines that uh, Napoleon had won the wa uh, Battle of uh, Waterloo. And this uh, triggered um, his uh, confrere uh, uh, Geoffroy to imagine a book-length uh, counterfactual of Napoleon winning the Battle of Waterloo under the title that says it all, Napoleon et la conquête du monde, histoire de la monarchie universelle. So if you want to 
if you're a bit nostalgic as a Francophone, you want to uh, imagine uh, univers a Monarchie Universelle under Napoleon. That's the first uh, book-length uh, counterfactual uh, history by Louis Geoffroy. All right, but this is just um, some inspiration which I found, uh, found exciting, so it invited me further to think counterfactually, to write counterfactual histories of international law. What would, have interna what would international law have looked like without for the First World War? What if um, Henry Truman had not uh, unilaterally declared jurisdiction of the continental shelf in 1945? What would that have done to the development of the law of the sea? And so on and so forth. So a couple of words on why that's relevant for international law. So I've hope, I hope to have brought home the point or at least made it sufficiently clear that a first main reason for engaging in this enterprise uh, is that it foregrounds contingency. So to prevent, also as Philip Roth writes in his novel, The Plot Against America, that everything, I quote him, that everything unexpected in its own time is chronicled on the page as inevitable. The terror of the unforeseen is what the science of history hides, turning a disaster into an epic." End of quote. So I also concede that if pushed, well, we know that the development of law and international law was not necessary, that if we look back, there were other turns that might have been plausible, but there are also many dynamics of legal thinking that makes, uh, tend to make us forget precisely that. And I've already mentioned rationalization, the process of making sense. I want to draw attention to one further specific phenomenon that I have not yet seen discussed, but which I find crucial in producing this effect of uh, yeah, forgetting contingency. And that is the dynamics of hindsight bias. So the social psychological phenomenon that we tend to overestimate the likelihood of outcomes once we know about them. And so it's the difference between ex ante and ex post likelihood assessments. Um, in international law, the recent arbitral decision in the Southwest China Sea, so between the Philippines and China, has created quite some, some ripples. We received much attention. In October last year already, there was the first partial award on jurisdiction where the tribunal said, yes, we are competent to decide. And I, I, this is unfortunately still anecdotal, and I wish to investigate this phenomenon more um, systematically and experimentally. But my colleagues were very hesitant to, say, to say, yes, the tribunal will find that it has jurisdiction. Because China had made the reservation, and you know, there were you know people said, yeah, maybe it will be a three-five decision. It's really not sure. So then the tribunal decided five to zero, no single arbitrator dissenting that it has jurisdiction, and then it was crystal clear, it could not have been otherwise. And really, I mean, you see this that people talk. Yeah, um, this is I've, I've, I've witnessed it. That then, yeah. I've, of course, you know, I mean, that's in their interest. You know, there's a bunch of reasons that then come up after the decision was taken. Yeah, because they, I mean, otherwise, uh, you know, um, a double counterfactual. So I know they couldn't have done otherwise because that would have just meant that they would have bowed to the powerful uh, China or it would have completely upset all the other states or, yeah, but the law is clear and, you know, it's, uh, you know, all these kind of reasons. So, yes, it had to be that way. As an expression of uh, hindsight bias. So it's a, well-observed phenomenon in many fields of thinking and social life, not so much yet in, uh, in law. The closest that I've uh, found research to come to the practice of law is in uh, the um, research on, on jury trials and the ineffectiveness of withdrawing or taking back evidence and the strategic moves of litigants to introduce evidence that they might know is inadmissible. Uh, but, you know, once the knowledge is out there, you can't uh, take it back. Um, and people have uh, 
investigated uh, this on in a, in a social psychological basis, but I haven't seen it investigated when, we, when it comes to thinking about law, thinking in the operation of the law, um, especially among lawyers. And uh, this is something I'm, I'm going to do with the students in a couple of weeks, but uh, um, in other fields I've learned uh, that, well, not only this phenomenon um, is um, prominent in the social life, but also that there are a number of dynamics that sustain and um, yeah, that, su that sustain it that I have reason to believe are also present, if not even stronger present, in a, in a, in more strongly present in an international law or law context. Uh, one of the dynamics that sustains hindsight bias, for instance, is the wish to count as an expert. Uh, so if I'm, I want to count as an expert of the law of the sea, I can't really admit any longer that I thought that the tribunal would have declined the exercise of jurisdiction. Now I would be termed um, a fool, uh, or I would, not, I would not count as an expert. Or in the investment law, if I was, had been around in the investment law in the 1990s, and I had said, yeah, but, you know, uh, the... Um, uh, tribunal decision in AAPL uh, Sri Lanka, that was really quite unlikely. What? Didn't you know about the uh, theory of arbitration without privity? I mean, that's all pretty uh, crystal clear. Uh, so the dynamics of having to count and wanting to count as an expert uh, is a dynamic that sustains hindsight bias and tends to make us forget on the cognitive level. So there's a motivational element to it. I want to count as an expert that makes us forget on a cognitive level, our um, likelihood assessment ex ante. And there are other dynamics. So the rush towards explaining the need for closure. Yeah? So there are these kind of dynamics that sustain the hindsight bias. And the first reason then for counterfactual thinking is to remember different possibilities, to remind of, to remember a contingency and to counter hindsight bias. There's also uh, social psychological research, again, in other fields. I'm only inspired, so this doesn't have, hasn't happened yet for law. That if you had asked, if you ask people to think of an alternative outcome before you ask them to assess the likelihood of the actual outcome, they tend to lower their likelihood assessment. Yeah. So also there is a reason for a counterfactual thinking. All right, that's the first point. Remind of contingency. Remind us of contingency. The second one, it's connected, but it's distinct, is to support explanations, maybe even stronger causal statements, in a context-sensitive uh, fashion. So another dynamic that, again, makes, um, reinforces hindsight bias, uh, height uh, increases ex post likelihood assessments, is the dynamic of integrating what has happened into analytical schemes, into um, grand theories that explain what has happened in terms of uh, systematic, systemic variables. So for instance, in international law, in terms of um, power balances, of uh, the international organization of states, about the distribution of means of production, um, no grand theory claims to determine what, has, what would happen in a specific case. But it's still the body of specific cases that sustains the theorizing. And I find it quite sobering, I must say, to contrast the conviction that we have uh, that we can explain the past, on the one hand, and the um, sheer incapacity that uh, we have when we want to explain anything that would happen or predict anything that would happen tomorrow. Um, so this also supports counterfactual thinking that it um, supports causal statements in a way that does not immediately buy 
into great theoretical narratives, but actually supports them in a rather atheoretical, context-sensitive, historical, if you wish, fashion. A third reason for counterfactual thinking I want to, is, is, quite, is quite different, is uh, not connecting to the other two, and I'll be brief in mentioning this because it also concerns a slightly different kind of counterfactual. Until now, I've talked about probable counterfactuals. What could possibly, probably have happened? A third reason would be more um, prone to pursuing specific normative commitments. So to show, even by miracle counterfactual, by postulations, not by plausible counterfactuals, but by miracle counterfactuals, that have a contrasting, irritating effect how the world is made up and to spur action. So to give you an example, I actually read, uh, I, I saw a, a girl next to me on the bus uh, up here reading um, uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman uh, short stories. And there's one that I, uh, that I very much like. It's a very short, uh, short, well, short, short story, uh, obviously, but <laughs> um, of 1940 already. It's called If I Were a Man. Sorry, I should use a different one, but uh, um, different example. But okay, uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman imagines um, the, uh, the life of a, of a housewife who one day wakes up and finds herself in the shoes of her husband, steps out the door and finds how the world is made by man for man because she lives it, um, she has enough of her um, conscience of her former self as a housewife, but now she finds herself in the the shoes of her husband and experiences that world. So that's a miracle counterfactual that makes other parts of the world or parts of the world that are not so easily seen clearly visible. So here, by changing, estranging reality, we learn more about it. Um, but that's a, a third one, a third reason on the side. So I want to move from the reasons why it uh, has attraction, I think, to a couple of thoughts on how to do it, um, how to think counterfactually. And the first big question is, well, what to change and how to change it? And that's quite tricky, yeah? because a lot of times making a certain, so claiming that a certain change would be plausible, now moving away from this uh, transformation into the um, of a housewife into the sh uh, who finds herself in the sh shoes of her husband, but back to the plausible counterfactuals. One of the great difficulties is to put your finger on a change that would actually be plausible without having to change too much of that context to make it plausible. So in the UN Charter, you have this uh, Article 43, uh, according to which um, member states would commit armed forces to the command of the Security Council. Uh, that never happened, of course. So, wouldn't it be a nice counterfactual, you know, in the in the view of um, atrocities ar around the world, uh, in Aleppo, and so on and so forth? Uh, thinking, well, what if that had happened? But would that have been plausible? Well, not really. So you go back, and well, wh wh why not? Um, so in the end, you. I make it a bit briefer, you come down with, well, I mean, of course, states were unwilling. All right, so under which conditions would they have been willing? So you start changing the reality in a way that makes the actors different. So they would have had to be willing, when would they have been willing, when would they have been willing, and so on and so forth. You have to change a lot for that plausible, for that kind of factual to become plausible, to take off the ground, so that actually then if you want to continue what would have happened in that alternative, you have you know, none of the reality that you need as a benchmark is, is there anymore. It's all lost. So there's a need for some kind of minimalism uh, for plausible changes to learn something about the world as, as, as we have it, not to create uh, a complete um, fictional scenario. And there's a claim, uh, a principle of co-tenability, so to say, that, I mean, this change was plausible, but only under the condition that, um, or if this had to be plausible, also other things would have had to be plausible. So there's uh, 
I, I'm drawing a lot on the work uh, of um, Ned Lebo, who's a historian slash international relations scholar. And to, to bring home that point of code tenability, he, he says, uh, yes, I mean, the resistance fighter against the Nazis in, in Poland would have uh, won the battle much either if they had, an, uh, if they had nuclear weapons. Yeah, all right, but you know, for them to have nuclear weapons, also the Nazis would have had nuclear weapons. So you're not, you know, that doesn't make any sense. So the best counterfactuals are near misses, alternatives that were possible or maybe even more likely than what has actually happened. Uh, such uh, instances include for international law, one thing I can easily think of is the very consequential Southwest Africa cases in the 19, early 19, um, or mid 1970s. Uh, which were, um, yeah, I don't want to get into detail there, but they, so they, they alienated newly independent states. They rejected the claim that um, Liberia and Ethiopia, Eritrea, Eritrea had brought against South Africa, against uh, South Africa's uh, conduct, uh, extension of its apartheid regime and its mandatory territory of Southwest Africa. The International Court of Justice in the 1972 decision first affirmed that it had jurisdiction and then by a split vote uh, only decided by the uh, casting vote of the president on the merits it said actually we can't decide it after all because uh, you two claimants you don't have standing to bring that claim against Southwest Africa. Newly independent states were furious the court was in a deep crisis for 10 years with one exception no new cases it was a very consequential decision that easily could have gone the other way it was even more likely that it would have gone the other way because circumstances really had to conspire for this decision to come about. Only 12 judges of a 15 judge bench decided actually in this case, one judge passed away just uh, shortly before, one was sick and another one was bullied by the president and the vice president not to sit in the case. So he just didn't, he just said, I leave, he just didn't vote. Zafratullah Khan from Pakistan, bullied by the Australian and um, British uh, judge not to sit in this case. Wonderful uh, background story. So the alternative was actually more likely. So those are good counterfactuals. It was actually more likely that that uh, would have happened. And then the history of the ICJ of international law would have been quite different. So there's much more to say about how, what to do, what not to do, not to stop too early in thinking through the consequences, not to stop too soon. Maybe just one more word on, is it then all fiction? What would have happened in the alternative? Contingency certainly cuts both ways. You know? So it's not that then the um, counterfactual story would somehow be more determinant than what actually happened. No, I mean, that's also for, uh, certainly a, a story of contingencies. But uh, still, it's not, I suggest, a mere, a mere fiction because also making sense of the past is oftentimes, well, it's, it's also very difficult. So the past doesn't speak to us either. Huh? So we make, have to make sense of it, and we would have to make equally sense of what would happen in alternatives. <coughs> but I concede, while well, we quickly or more easily lose data points, huh? or more or less positivistically um, support from reality in arguing what would have happened. There are ways of dealing with that. Uh, legal, there's a great legal historian, a uh, Belgian for, um, legal historian called Raoul van uh, Keinechem, who writes about the development of uh, law in, in Europe and um, tries to tease out the influence of the reception of Roman law on the development of um, European uh, jurisdictions. And he does so with a counterfactual in which he plays through what would have happened had Roman law, Loma, <coughs> had Roman law not been uh, received. And he does so with historical, the historical benchmark of England that was not, uh, where Roman law was not received. So he has uh, a comparator of what would have happened that he can also play through in the other contexts. So for international law, if we think about international investment law and what difference an Apple body, a review instance, would have made in that field of law, so it doesn't exist there. Um, but if it had, had been introduced maybe in the 1990s or some years after that, after that, there were proposals for that, 
has been established, what we can learn from the experience that we have with international trade law, where such a thing does exist. Uh, so there's, we don't need to speculate in a, in a vacuum. There are contexts that we can learn from. So I've talked about background, why to do it, how to do it. Um, in a closing couple of minutes, I want to reflect on um, the experiences of writing counterfactual in two instances. In the paper that um, forms the background to this talk, I play through more specifically whether it could have happened that the International Trade Organization had been established around 1949. I think that's quite a likely scenario. And what the potentiality of that change actually is. One drawback that I find here, and it's a drawback that has been articulated as a critique against a lot of counterfactual thinking in historiography, is that it tends to place quite some emphasis on the choices and actions of individuals. So in, the making, in making it plausible that the International Trade Organization was established in 1949, my story goes, it would have been quite likely had um, William Cox, one of the great supporters of the International Trade Organization in the Truman administration, stayed in the administration, had not gone to private practice, and had, I think it would have required only a mild push in the Truman administration. The story goes, well, the Congress never ratified the statute. Yes, that's true, but it wasn't hostile to the statute. There was just no advocate really anymore. And if there had been an advocate, you know, people didn't feel so strongly about this. So, uh, Congress could have been swayed and Truman could have been swayed to actually invest a bit of political capital to push the um, charter of the International Trade Organization through Congress and other states then actually stood ready to adopt it too if the United States had adopted it. But it actually turns on the decisions of these individuals. And that is now, even if you contextualize them, it goes a bit against the impetus of, well, not placing too much emphasis on the great men who make history. That's one. And another one, another instance that's not in the paper but that I've looked at more recently, is the potentiality of the new international economic order in the 1970s, 60s and 70s. So a big push for remaking economic relations on the global plane in the mid-60s, above all, in the early 70s. Uh, a lot of debates at the time, a lot of political action, a lot of fuzz, and it's actually a um, topic that has increased, that has received increasing uh, attention. So in light of this economic injustice, as I tried to uh, sketch it at the opening with the richest 20% uh, holding 94% of all wealth and consuming 80% of all resources. You know, you kind of want to think that it could have been otherwise and people now turn increasingly towards the new international economic order and the moment where that could have happened. I couldn't place my finger on a counterfactual scenario. I don't think that at that moment an alternative was plausible or possible. I'm really sorry to, to say that and I hesitate drawing that conclusion, but I think that's the right conclusion. And so the de second danger next to placing too much emphasis on the role of individuals is nostalgia. So I wish it was otherwise, but um, I think their counterfactual thinking can help us to understand better why the new international economic order has not succeeded in the way it, um, people wish it uh, would have succeeded. Um, but it does not identify a path towards a plausible counterfactual scenario. So I have um, hoped to, to show the potential, but also some dangerous pitfalls, some open questions. Uh, I do hope to have shown that it's and that's also how I really experienced it, a, a very fruitful, uh, important enterprise and, well, a possible avenue to counteract the tendencies of rationalization, solidification, it's not a nice word, 
of what has happened. Um, and I hope to have uh, shown that counterfactual thinking can be a tool of weakening what has happened so as to strengthen the possibilities and potentiality for change in international law. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to take uh, about an hour or so for for questions. Um, so I'm going to keep a keep a queue. So if, if I note you, then I've, I've got you in the queue. Uh, we're using microphones not to project any sound, but mainly to record uh, the questions for the video. So make sure before you start asking your question that uh, we circulate uh, a microphone to you. Okay, so uh, I'll start going around the left. Leaf, leaf. Um, the microphone can be untethered from the base if it's easier to circulate afterwards. Oh. Oh. I don't want to hold it. Uh, <laughs> so much work. Uh, thank you. I, I, I wanted to ask you to uh, explain to me the point you made about expertise and how it encourages hindsight bias. I, don't, I didn't understand that. Mm -hmm. um, I could see how that might be the case in history. So I guess in history, you know, if you, if you spend your life trying to understand the causes of some historical event, then maybe that could generate the impression that it was more, um, less contingent than it actually was, right? Because you understand all the causes why it happened and you focus on those. But I didn't see why that would be the case in law. I mean, my, my impression, you, you know better than I, but for hanging out with some law professors sometimes, they're often very proud of displaying how they think that a, a case in the past was wrongly decided or that some legal decision was a bad decision and their theory shows it and they see that as a kind of expertise. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't sure how, why that would generate any kind of hindsight bias. It just depends on the theory you have. I mean, maybe if you're, if you're a formalist or a Dworkinian, maybe that would generate a kind of hindsight bias. But I don't see the general point. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I think, um, yeah, so it's very difficult to, to articulate what kind of business lawyers are in when they think about uh, past cases. Are they, uh, so it's not uh, arguing uh, about causality uh, in the sense, in the same way that historians or political scientists would uh, argue about why something has, has happened. Um, and I and I acknowledge and I have the, 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 the same experience that uh, there's a lot of dispute about uh, whether a past case was decided uh, correctly or whether it should have been decided uh, otherwise according to certain uh, normative standards maybe of distributive justice or uh, or otherwise those tendencies e exist and I, as I said so the phenomenon as far as I know has not been studied uh, in law uh, yet um, But I do see a predominance of perspectives cast onto legal practice that uh, give reason to believe that legal thinking is troubled by and reinforces hindsight bias. Those are the dynamics that I try to um, expressed with the concept of, of rationalization here, leaning uh, on the work of uh, Roberto Unger, who describes it as, well, the process of linking concrete developments, decisions, to cross-cutting principles and, and rules. So you might be a Dorkinian in trying to reconstruct the legal system as um, a system of, of decisions that make sense or, or to try to present it in the light of the best theory and thereby making sense of what has happened. But not only. So the um, legal legal doctrine, and I think that's really a, um, not only in, in, in Europe um, and not only in, in, in Germany more specifically, um, prevailing mode of legal thinking that um, fits tries to fit practice within 
principles or legal doctrine. That practice also exists in the culture of uh, writing restatements, commentaries. Um, in the in the U.S. context, I don't know uh, as I as I know it a bit. Uh, so it's these dynamics that reinforce the hindsight bias, and the expertise. I think it's um, it's one thing to uh, discuss whether a case was decided correctly, and another to predict how a case would be decided. And another interesting dimension of uh, the research, so I set up the questionnaire already for the students in a couple of weeks, is actually to tease out to what extent normative assessments correlate with the likelihood assessments. So if you think that a decision was more likely if you agree with it in substance or otherwise. So I don't think we as, as lawyers even, so this was some, I, I ran the questionnaire past a, a colleague we said, yeah, but what do you mean when you ask uh, about the likelihood assessment? Whether you agree in terms of substance, so do you think that that was right, or do you, is it about probability, the likelihood of, of an outcome? And I think uh, the, the uh, question suggested that he, for sure, was, um, uh, was thinking more in terms of rightness, and there might actually be a quite close uh, correlation. So I'm realize I'm tiptoeing a bit around the specific uh, question, um, but that is also because I think that uh, not so much is known yet about the phenomenon and how it operates in, in legal thinking. Okay, okay. Um, just pass the microphone, just two, two spots. Thank you very much. Um, Hi, I was uh, scribbling lots of notes, so thank you very much for all the comments. Um, you said um, when you mentioned Charlotte, um, Perkins Gilman, I was actually hoping you were going to say yellow wallpaper yeah. because that's my favorite short story by her. Um, and I always, was I, was, I always wonder what men think of that story <laughs> as far as uh, counterfactual that was ideas. My neighbor on the bus was reading the yellow wallpaper. Yeah, okay, so um, <laughs> yeah, well anyway, what would men think if they read that um, short story? Um, I guess there were um, some things I, I thought I'd sort of pose to you and <coughs> Here's one of them. I find myself thinking that good writers are always counterfactual because after I'm done reading what they've presented to me, I'm like, holy, you know, um, as E.H. Carr says, you know, if Cleopatra's nose wasn't considered attractive, what would have happened? You know, and that good writers sort of plant these seeds with us to realize that, you know, so much is about accident, not intent. And so much is about, um, uh, I don't want to say no merit, but just there's, there's this homo like melange of things that happen to go together. So one thing missing from it would lead to sort of very different things. So I guess sort of I was thinking that, you know, if we, we don't have much counterfactual stuff happening, that actually that's a real criticism of writing that's out there, that we're not having enough people hypothesize well. Um, but also I was wondering if there's some places we can see it in law and it's not being done by academics, it's actually being mm -hmm. done by judges. And so that idea that there's places in judicial decisions that we might normally label as obiter and it's where a judge might say, well, if you, know, if you had been married longer, I might have thought this, you know, or you know, in some cases I look at, they say, if it was different parties here, perhaps I could have addressed that issue you said, but that's not what I have in front of me. And, and then in another place in judicial decisions, in moments if that subject has an idea of speaking to sentence, that um, different facts are sort of reflected ab about to sort of justify what might be considered a very creative alternative. And maybe that's a way to sort of notice counterfactual moments. Um, and, and I just, uh, finally, I, th I thought I'd say that um, I'm not too concerned about hindsight bias um, because I think, you know, in law we're so, we're so um, dependent upon precedent. Mm -hmm. So as one workshop group I belong to, we say hi hindsight isn't 2020, it's 50-50. You know, and so it's consistently influencing everything. So how we decide it's that much worse in one circumstance than another is hit and miss. You know, that, that we're always going to be thinking back to 
to how our ideas link to something. Mm -hmm. So we'll always be doing that process. And so it's this, it's an unavoidable quality of studying law and practicing law. So to be okay with it. I'm not saying necessarily embrace it, but it's it's not the it's it's not the the worry that you need to be worried about, <laughs> I guess. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. The 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 uh, Cleopatra's nose counterfactor is a beautiful uh, one. Uh, Two uh, yeah, Carr mentions it. He adopts it from uh, Blaise Pascal. It's also linguistically uh, beautiful. So, si le nez de Cleopatra aurait été plus court. Tout la face du monde aurait changé. All the face of the world would have changed. It's just, it's also, it's aesthetically just, sorry for my awful uh, French, probably I've made a bunch of mistakes, but it's just so, if, the, if, the, uh, um, if Cleopatra's nose had been shorter, the whole face of the world, I could have also done it in a shorter way, would have been uh, different. It's just, uh, it's great. Um, but it's an accident, huh? so it's, a, it's not a problem counterfactual. It's completely uh, accidental. There's no reason why Cleopatra's nose could, should, might have been uh, shorter or so. But it's uh, it's a great um, it's a great uh, idea, all the same. Um, I agree that there's a lot of counterfactual thinking in the practice so about uh, the reasoning about consequences in judicial reasoning and in international law. It's it's as in other fields of law. Uh, it's uh, very present in the determination of causation. Uh, so um, had it been in the absence of this particular act or factor of, uh, of the context, um, also in the determination of uh, uh, damages. Um, so in the uh, ruling precedent here of the Permanent Court of International Justice, um, reparations need to uh, reinstate uh, I can't uh, reproduce the language in, uh, in verbatim, but it's need to reinstate the situation that would have existed had the illegal act not occurred. Mm -hmm. yeah? It's completely arbitrary, actually, because had the legal act, uh, so so it's it's probably you know it's supposed to be easy. Yeah? So you can you can establish the uh, um, the the compensation and uh, the the remedy against the uh, benchmark. What if the legal act had not occurred? But if the if the illegal act, but if the illegal act had not occurred, had not occurred, a similar act that might have been legal, just not illegal, would have probably happened. And then you know, but it's, it's it becomes really difficult to, to uh, play that through. But it's pretty arbitrary to just presume that the context would have frozen, only the illegal act would have been taken out. But uh, this is uh, yeah very present in, um, in in the practice of the law. Um, and then the reasoning from precedent is a dynamic that sustains hindsight bias. Uh, I, I would uh, add that. And whether or not to be worried by it, uh, yeah, well, um, it's, it's, it's not neither, neither or. So I mean, I'm um, uh, in a, um, a different, different <laughs> me in a different capacity. Yeah. Or in a, I, I'm a big fan of reasoning from precedent in international law because it actually adds to, um, to some stability and uh, criticizability of decisions. Yeah, so in investment law, to stick to that uh, field uh, that I refer to um, a bit now, um, it's one of the big problems that uh, you know decisions conflict without uh, relating to one another. Yeah, it's very ad it's it's not only ad hoc arbitration; it also seems like ad hoc decision, uh, um, where you, you lack the um, the steadiness to criticize and also to rein in discretion. So uh, somebody once asked me, "Why well, does this counterfactual thinking then doesn't it unravel the practice of the law?" I mean, yes. I mean, if uh, um, to the extent that, and it's the right description, I think uh, reasoning from precedence is a uh, large part of uh, of the law across the board. This has nothing to do with common or civil law uh, kind of distinctions. Uh, yes. So it um, depends on the doses and uh, um, on, on the context. So it's. Uh, I, I, I think in, in many fields now, there's the overemphasis on, on that part of making sense and the absence. So if this, if if, if my um, talk is or ideas are, are so successful that we're only doing counterfactual thinking and nobody thinks about reasoning from precedent anymore, I will make the exact opposite argument. But I, I don't see that I don't see that happening quite yet. Thank you. Okay, can we pass that microphone to the right to Sue? So 
thank you so much. I think uh, uh, it's a truly wonderful talk. And uh, in fact, I, uh, I think uh, your point about counterfactual thinking uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, in, in probably in, li in line with the uh, previous uh, uh, questions, I will uh, uh, continue the same line of reasoning uh, about uh, the already presence of counterfactual thinking in, 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 a, in a way how we teach law, in a way of legal, legal reasoning, and so on. So, so I, I just have uh, three comments. So the first comment is about the way how do we, uh, we, do we teach law. And I will give you an example of private law. Uh, the way, for, for instance, I taught contract law, it's, it's, I think it's a it's clear example of uh, country, uh, counterfactual thinking. We, we usually we take an example, for instance, decision of Supreme Court of Canada, and then we, uh, we uh, tested this decision against uh, five, six, uh, seven uh, imaginary cases, potentially cases we slightly uh, change the facts. Now, why we did so? Uh, probably in order uh, first to clarify the decision, to make sure that the original decision is clear. But I, but I also think it's, it's, it's fairly crucial to do this uh, exercise in order to uh, make sure that the rule set by the Supreme Court of Canada is a, is a rule which is clear enough is, and is general enough to capture uh, the uh, a, a wide range of potential decisions. So there's an issue here of generality. And I think uh, uh, this point of generality, it's a significant point with relation to your, your point about uh, counterfactual thinking. And I think the underlying basis here is the idea of legal formalism. The idea that we, 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 uh, uh, that we, we have a general rule, we apply this rule, and usually we do have some exception. We can call it public policy or other exception, but the idea is that uh, we do have general rule. And what brings me to the, my second comment, uh, I would like to hear your opinion whether you'll be able to situate your point about counterfactual thinking uh, within the debate between legal formalism and legal realism, and uh, more generally, uh, legal realist attack on legal formalism. Because it seems that the whole point of legal realism was to focus on particular case and uh, to analyze particular case uh, given the particular circumstances of the particular case. So the point of counter, uh, counterfactual thinking seems to be uh, uh, seems to negate this uh, this uh, uh, path of legal uh, realism. Okay, it seems to say that uh, let's forget about uh, present circumstances. Let's test it against different circumstances. And this seems to, seems to me fundamentally cha challenge the fundamental point of legal realism and to support um, uh, legal formalism, at least, at least as uh, legal uh, realism depicted legal formalism. So th my, this is my second comment. And my last comment is about the scope of your argument. Because you focus on, uh, on international law and uh, international relations, and I'm aware there's a, a lot of literature which actually uh, make a point about the distinctive, distinctive nature of international law, distinctive nature of international law interpretation. But for the purposes of your argument, at least to me, it seems that you, you make a, a, a broader point, that actually your argument actually mm -hmm. goes beyond. So just to summarize, so I, make, uh, I raised the point about the, the, the way of teaching, especially private law, is that we do apply uh, counterfactual thinking. The second point about uh, uh, situating your debate within uh, legal realism and legal formalism with general rules. And the third point about the scope of your argument, whether uh, you, you'll be able to defend uh, a, a point that your argument apply solely to international law, rather to law generally. Yeah, uh, thanks so much. So maybe with the, the, the last point uh, first. So. Uh, I hope that what I've said speaks to non-international lawyers and also to fields of law other than international law. And the way I set it up, also the, the references, I mean, uh, Niklas Luhmann has, uh, uh, for sure in the 70s, not thought of international law. Um, 
uh, Raoul van Kanichem, it's about the development of uh, domestic law, law in Europe. So a lot of the, my sources of inspiration and the discourses that I pick up are not about international law. So I make my point in the field of international law because I want to make it in a, in a field, not on the level of law generally, because I feel uh, at ease if I can think about a field of, of um, practice, of reference, that in my case happens to be, not only happens to be, it in my case is international law, but I hope that there's um, things that uh, people can draw from it in, in many other fields. So there is maybe a note why I think it's particularly, uh, I'm even hesitant to say that because I don't want to um, distinguish or make it, make it uh, something specific to international law. But one thing, no, so I don't. Okay. So I hope it works for more than international law. Counterfactual thinking negates circumstances that legal realism has um, been at pains to tease out. Um, no, I don't think so, because it is concerned with plausible counterfactuals, not postulations. So it is what is plausible under the circumstances. Yeah? So it's with uh, Marx in the 18th Primaire, it's People make their own history, but not as they choose, but under the circumstances that they are presented to them, or under the circumstances in which they find themselves. It's not, uh, yeah, it's not equal plausibility, probability of a different decision, but under the given circumstances. And it may be that under given circumstances, no other decision was plausible. Yeah, so contingency is not a property of developments or of concrete decisions. Well, it's a claim about modality. So it's not, uh, it, it's, it, it doesn't, so it's something that was highly likely. Uh, highly, uh, now maybe even, so there are circumstances that um, did not allow for a different conclusion. Yes, that, I mean, I'm not denying that that is a possibility. <laughs> yeah but it remains a possibility. Uh, and the first point, I just love it. Huh? I mean, this is, I think, how, uh, this is a great way of teaching. And, uh, and uh, in, the, in the last year, I've also taught more like that. And, <laughs> and, uh, um, and there is some, some of that way of teaching also, in, as I have experienced it. It's the uh, so one thing I, I was taught and that I've always liked to do is uh, to ask uh, about hypothetical appeals to try to find the the, the, the making and breaking point of decisions and all these kind of things where you can say where it could have been otherwise. Yeah, so it's not, it's not absent. Yeah? So, but, uh, and, and to put it in the forefront in, in that way is, is uh, really, really wonderful. Okay, uh, just slide to, to John. The, um, yeah, I agree with everybody else that said we, we, we do something like you know, the counterfactual reasoning all the time when we're you know, changing the facts slightly and do you think the outcome would be different? It's, um, it's sort of the best we can do in law because we don't, we can't really experiment the way we'd like to experiment. Um, you know, where, you know, you, you want to know what the speed of light is. You can, you, you, you can measure it any number of times and if you keep coming up with observations within the range of experimental error, you sort of say it's fine. But, but the whole idea of that kind of experimentation, right, is that you can repeat the experiment ad lib, right, as many times as you want to. Um, and, 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 and then and, and you can keep a bunch of, in terms of your apparatus, you keep a bunch of parameters constant, and then you vary the variables and you see what difference it makes, right? That's, that's the whole idea of experimentation. You, you see what, when, when you vary the variables, you see what difference it makes. And the only difficulty is, right, you've got this case, well, you can't run it again and see if the outcome is different with this one fact different. So you can't, you can't experiment in, this, in quite the same way in law. So we're, we're, we're sort of like the cosmologists, right? We can't, we can't run the Big Bang again and with, with this little thing changed. We can't experiment like that. So you just make the best observations you can and then predictions and then, and then hope some other celestial event comes along and your observations are consistent with your predictions. Right, it, it, so it's, it's that situation where you can't really experiment 
you know, to see if you can get replicable results. You just have to keep watching and see if your predictions fit some theory. But it's, it, 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 it's the same sort of thing as just, you know, varying the variables. Except that you can't. <laughs> Yeah, so I think that's uh, that, that's that's spot on. So that puts us on on par, maybe, with a um, uh, cosmologist who cannot uh, rerun the the Big Bang, at least not in its uh, entirety. But also with with all of historiography, which is why the um, I mean, there's a lot of uh, bad practices of counterfactual histo histor history of writing in the field of historiography. Uh, one, um, the volume that maybe made it most uh, popular by Neil Ferguson, it's called Virtual Histories, it's just awful. And it does a disservice to, um, uh, to, to historians and to, uh, to this way of thinking. But there's also a lot of good practice um, that is um, yeah, much more subtle and also um, stays closer to the context and so on and so forth. So I think, uh, and, and the reason why, why they advocate this mode of thinking is, is precisely that. I mean, the historians face the same dilemma as cosmologists and lawyers, they cannot rerun history. Um, so yeah, I'm, 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 I think that's, uh, that's a, a spot on. Yeah. Great, great talk. I, I, I triggered a lot of thoughts. So here, I'm just going to run one thought through you and then ask a, a more general question. The, the first thought had to, has to be with, I was a bit puzzled with the initial examples that you use, right? The Texaco ruling and then the, mm. the Sri Lanka ruling, because I thought to myself, you know, how do we determine which facts to think about counterfactually uh, for this kind of inquiry to be useful in law? And I thought to myself, well, these arbitral award were just inter partes, right, between the company and the country. It's quite possible that um, the rest of the world could have just turned around and thought, well, these things are not binding on us, right? We're just going to take a different course. We're just going to ignore them. So th there seems to be more to the story than just the, 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 the arbitral award itself, right? There seems to be, you know, how did that come to be accepted and what if, had, if it had not? At the same time, I think about uh, precedence cases at the domestic level, and there I seem to think of them differently, right? It is true that if, or, or it seems to be true that if Brown v. Board had not been decided the way it was decided, then the shape of the equal protection in the U.S. might not be the same. It is true, it seems to be true, at least it's presented this way, that if you had not had Roe v. Wade, right, the shape of what's happening with abortion in the U.S. might be uh, different today, right? And what's different here is that we tend to understand these constitutional Supreme Court decisions as being binding on the relevant parties, which, um, uh, the Texaco and the Sri Lankan decisions were not, at least they were binding on the immediate parties, but not on the rest of the world, where you seem to say, well, they were sine qua nons of what happened thereafter, right? Our Supreme Court in Canada seems to have understood this, right? In recent uh, constitutional um, litigation about whether some new minimal sentences attached to drug offenses were unconstitutional, it said, well, it might not be that the sentence for the offenses that are before us are gross and disproportionate or cruel and unusual, but there could be possible cases in which um, they would be disproportionate and therefore we're going to rule this kind of law to be unconstitutional based on these hypothetical example. Again, we're dealing with the Supreme Court who's very conscious that it's the final mm -hmm. deciding body for the kind of decision. And there I think, well, there's some value in thinking, well, what if that had not happened there? The law would be different just seems to be a bit different at the international level, at least in the context of these arbitral awards. So that's the initial thought. Mm. The second larger question has to do with, well, so you, you run different concepts together, right? So counterfactuals on one side, what if? And then you seem to run that in line with the idea of causation, and then you mentioned probabilities. Some people think of these things as being quite different things, right? Some people have theories about causation which says, well, Something is the cause of something else only if there's a physical flow of things between these two things, mm -hmm. right? Uh, any omission, somebody didn't do something, that doesn't cause anything. But obviously, counterfactually, it might matter. You might say, what if that person had done something, right? So some people distinguish counterfactuals from causation as being distinct categories, and then probabilities as being something else also. You seem to want to run them in a bit of a, an impressionistic way together. I wonder if you... Uh, it would not be useful to just delve it to a bit more into what are the concepts that you're actually working with. Thank you. 
Uh, yes, I, I'll do that. So I can't um, do that off the cuffs just now. Um, and uh, yeah, I grant that. Uh, so it's um, uh, yeah. Th there's maybe a bit more that I could could say in uh, in, in, in defense. Um, um, yeah, but but that's 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 true. I take that on board. Um, with regard to the initial examples, um, it is uh, also true, and I might not have made that clear enough, that it's yeah not only the decisions, so not only the decisions under the circumstances as they presented themselves, that they might have uh, been um, decided differently, but also the process that made these decisions into what they are. So I mentioned that there were other decisions at this time that did go into the opposite direction. So how come that now we uh, we teach uh, with uh, Texaco and AAPL versus Sri Lanka and not with the uh, this uh, awards next to them? Um, and it is in, is an interesting thought, but also it's uh, quite a difficult one um, to to think through what the mindset of the arbitrators, uh, judges, uh, ought to be. So in this case, uh, to what extent should they reflect on the systemic repercussions of their arbitral awards because uh, they might foresee that they have uh, these repercussions because the idea that they are only binding between the parties is uh, true in law but not in, uh, in, in fact. Um, the, what, the bigger question is to which facts or which elements to change. So these examples lead to uh, a focus on, on decisions. Um, the International Trade Organization example on institutions. Um, these two these set of examples tend to err a bit on the side of, uh, of individuals and the differences that they would have made, uh, just as well as playing through uh, what if concrete individuals had not become international lawyers. So there was a chance that Hirsch Lauterpacht, an eminent scholar with many different contributions to international law, could have become a piano player. His wife was a very successful piano player, and that's how they actually met. But um, yeah, so yeah, but it's again like uh, as though he would have made uh, like, you know, he did make a difference in international law. But still, um, another uh, uh, possibility would be events. Yeah? So international law without uh, the First World War. Um, and you might learn something about the relationship, uh, sounds a bit too grand, but uh, between law and reality. So how much does it react and doesn't it react and so on and so forth. Um, but those, th those are, are different, different possibilities. And I'm, um, yeah, I'm not uh, set on, on one uh, particular one there. I think they have different, different potential. Uh, those would be my thoughts. I think I'm going to ask you, maybe ask the next, uh, the next question and maybe try and um, make, a, make a suggestion. So I, I think that your, your initial premise or uh, your, your motivating premise that there is this phenomenon which you refer to as, as legal thinking, it's a more philosophical question. Um, there's a phenomenon which you refer to as legal thinking, which has a certain dynamics to it or a certain structure, which uh, forces us maybe or pushes us away from counterfactual sort of uh, explorations or, or thinking. And a number of people, I think, have sort of fought back against that, that premise. So, for example, there are dissenting opinions in judicial decisions, which, which certainly look like manifestations of, of counterfactual possibilities, at least. Um, lawyers teaching, uh, or law professors teaching cases by looking at a, a number of imaginary alternatives. Uh, a, third, uh, a third way, um, uh, lawyers, I think this was the first question from, from LP, lawyers who uh, 
uh, quite uh, proud and, and frequent uh, dissenters of cases I think were wrongly decided. So a, a sort of a range or a sample of uh, types of uh, practices or bits of evidence which point against that, that initial premise that legal thinking kind of, it's got this, this sort of almost a systematic push away from counterfactual thinking. So I think it, it might it might help to try and clarify a little mm -hmm. bit more what that concept of legal thinking is, where it's where it's being drawn from, whether it's something like an internal point of view um, that uh, that is being referred to, uh, which is a way of trying to trying to you know make it make it more concrete. And here might be the, su the suggestion. Just get your thoughts on on this. Uh, is that law? I mean, there's a way of sp speaking about law. Uh, in general jurisprudence in which it claims certain things. So a law claims mm. a right to rule or claims an authority, and you kind of build up these, these grand claims by looking at different institutional understandings and practices. And it might be that uh, this concept of legal thinking could be better motivated in that way by saying that there might be, for example, rule of law considerations against the idea of counterfactual possibilities being among or within the image of law, the, the self-image that law portrays. Uh, you, you could imagine that if law had as a part of its self-image built into it the idea that there are alternative possibilities which, which may have been more probable or might, might, uh, might be better normatively in certain ways, that could be a kind of damaging self-image. Self mm -hmm. um, now, I can't, I can't help but, but uh, uh, bring up my favorite example of a real brutal way of dealing with counterfactual possibilities. You might be familiar with the, the example. It's an ancient Greek uh, city-state. It's either Locria or Locrius, but the, the inhabitants were Locrians, and they had this practice whereby any citizen uh, of Locrius or Locria, maybe somebody can, can Google it to, to help me on that, they had this practice where any citizen could propose a change to law. They could come before their community and say, I, would, I think the new law ought to be X or or different from what it is, and here's my proposal for a new norm or a new, uh, a new rule. And the, 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 the remarkable thing about the Locrians is that any citizen who did that had to do so with a noose around their neck. With, Such, that? with a noose around their neck. So that if their proposal was voted down by the rest of their, their, uh, their fellow citizens, they would, be, they would be executed. And as far as I know, the reasoning was is that anyone who shows themselves to be opposed to the laws that are in place and can't convince the rest of their community to come along with them was a kind of threat, right? <laughs> now, I mentioned that's a brutal example of Now, I'm really afraid about my, way, <laughs> about my ride home, huh? Um, <laughs> this, uh, <laughs> but it, it's, it's an example where you might think there's, a, there's an image which law has, maybe a democratic right. image in this case, in which for reasons of certainty or stability or just general rule of law expectations which are created by law, that part of law's self-image is to try and push us away from or force us away from counterfactual possibilities within, within the very image of law itself. So you can have dissenting opinions, you can have law professors teaching law in different ways, but the image of law is an emanation from the state has mm -hmm. to be, or not, not just states, as, as you and I agree, there's not just states that make, make law, but any official or mm -hmm. Uh, effective legal order has a certain self-image to keep up, and that might be. And that's not to say that the rest of the argument falls apart. I mean, there's still value no. in the counterfactual mm. thinking, but I think just to motivate that initial premise to to maybe. You know. It's uh, thank you so much. So it's a very uh, in intriguing, slightly frightening uh, s suggestions uh, and an in invitation. And I, and I will definitely uh, follow up on that and look that up. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great story that fits, fits very well. I also welcome the invitation to um, argue more from, as you put it, uh, the image of the law. And, and I think they are, are yeah, those considerations, uh, the right to, to rule, rule of law considerations that um, push against a uh, prominent place in thinking counterfactually about international law, not in its uh, operation, uh, in, in establishing causation or damages or so. Um, I would still want to locate the 
phenomenon on the level of, of, of social reality among uh, situated actors because I need that if well otherwise the, I mean I, uh, the, the setup would otherwise be very very different so now I, I, I set up the arguments in favor of counterfactual thinking not the least with a view towards increasing possibilities of, uh, of change and that is really a um, way of setting it up that connects to situated actors who think in a certain certain way and I would hope that um, uh, the, the practice of counterfactual thinking and then further steps can work on that level and I and I take uh, as you summarize them several uh, yeah, I would say nuances, but maybe they're uh, together more than just more than nuances, but a stronger pushback against the um, argument that there is actually a tendency of of forgetting of um, self of re of dynamics that reinforce hindsight bias and and so on. Um, I'm not so sure about that on, on, on balance. It might also be a different context and so on. So, but that I um, need to think about further, but also investigate uh, further. So, um, yeah. I just thought of an example of what you just said. Isn't there when um, Khrushchev had just got power and he addressed, I'm not going to use the correct word, but equivalent to the assembly, yeah. and he, he yelled out, something akin to who saw who sees a problem with what I'm talking about and nobody nobody says anything and he said that's why nobody was brave enough to challenge Stalin like I it's it's in some speech he gave and it was just this moment of sort of being hypothetically counterfactual to demonstrate that if people were so concerned yeah. after Stalin's times was over that that they couldn't they couldn't do too much anyway and, and also Rousseau inventing a piano a little too late, if you know that story, him showing up and he had invented a 10-key piano and the piano forte had actually already uh -huh. been invented. So, uh, I mean, there are many uh, so, so near, near misses. So we had to get a living as a uh, newspaper yeah. writer. Yeah. yeah, no, there's, uh, yeah, we could. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm always, um, I always welcome uh, further suggestions. I have uh, a couple of others which lead me away from international law, like like the, uh, Cleopatra's notes or the or the piano or so or uh, um, yeah a, a, a Germany was declared uh, um, a democratic republic uh, only a couple of minutes before um, um, uh, Liebknecht declared it a socialist uh, republic and I mean not that that you know you also wonder did it really make a difference there was a couple of minutes uh, in between but uh, uh, how come that one was accepted and the other then not and um, what if it had been just a notch quicker and uh, now there's there are many uh, interesting uh, near misses, and what would have resulted as a consequence. Yeah. Well, uh, so as a first year law student, I definitely see the value of counterfactuals and just like the general cases we're going through as illustrative of the law. But I'm trying to really figure out how we can take that to international law, where we have s like a lot more factors concerning how these decisions are made, and things maybe outside of the law also affect decisions like political pressure and you're mentioning unlikely things happen. And considering the fact that um, if you do take a counterfactual history and you bring up examples of like the World Trade Organization going through, we always have to keep in mind that throughout, you pick one counterfactual and then you assume what would happen if everything happens in normal course. But um, unlikely things happen in the normal course of things. And it's actually very unlikely that nothing unlikely happens. No, no. So no. How, how do we really get value from that if we have if we can't really know which what happens after these counterfactuals? Uh, no, that's um, uh, uh, true. Uh, so that's what I meant with uh, that contingency cuts both ways. So it's also in arguing about what would have happened in an alternative that there's, I mean, that's, that's not, uh, in any way uh, determin determinant in a way that what actually happened is not. Uh, it's also um, contingent in a similar in a similar way. Uh, one way of uh, gaining traction is with, for instance, these historical benchmarks. So to argue, play through 
what if uh, Roman law had not been received in France? Well, let's look a bit at how uh, the law developed in England, where it was not received. What if an appellate body had been established in um, investment law, say in the 1990s? We can learn a bit from the developments of um, a trade law where such an institution had was established in the 1990s. Um, so, yes, so um, contingency cuts, cuts uh, both ways. Um, but so which now, in a way, undercuts the argumentation about what could have happened, but it also um, undercuts the certainty of what actually happened. So it's uh, from, from the point of view of, uh, let's say, uh, 1945, the ITO, International Trade Organization, would have been established around that time, let's say 1949, the state in which we find ourselves now has might have a similar probability than another one. It's not, you know, that's the point that it's not more likely because it has actually happened. And there were many um, twists, turns uh, in between uh, so that what actually happened still might have been equally likely, unlikely, or maybe even more, maybe even less likely than an alternative, not suggesting that that alternative was somehow uh, determined. First of all, I would like to say, wow, that is a very, <laughs> that is a very brave first year law student. So well done. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> really, that's fantastic. So I think, okay, I've been a law professor for 20 years and I'm usually shy in groups like this. I at least could also make a, a question or two. <laughs> <laughs> if my, our first year law students can. Um, uh, two small things, and then uh, I, I'd like your idea on a, an actual question. Uh, the small things, one of my uh, foreign students, uh, she happened to have been from China, uh, after a few weeks of trying to really figure out law, came up to me and she said, I think I have it. <laughs> she said, the law is the law except for the facts. <laughs> Yeah, you know, she's trying to figure out what is it that common law means, right? Because she's so used to or was so used to a statutory law. So the law is the law except for the facts. I liked that as a theory of the common law. And for uh, reading counterfactual novels, uh, I think it's none better than Michael Chabon. Have you read any of his no. work? Oh, he's fantastic. And one of the books is The Yiddish Policeman's Union. And it's an idea that instead of um, establishing Israel, uh, the, the Jews who were ex excluded established a land in Alaska. So it's really fantastic. Anyway. Um, I, for me, I wonder about the power of using uh, counterfactuals going forward instead of looking at history, right? And so how would you, or how, who do you know that you would suggest to read who's using counterfactuals to try to make arguments about maybe the, the issue that you brought up? You know, the increasing, the increasing concerns of global economic inequality and the way that politics are being strangled by it. I mean, I think um, using the counterfactuals in some progressive forward-looking way would be something that I, you know, it, it seems like a natural use of counterfactuals, and so I'm wondering if some of your reading, uh, you've come across one or two, you know, truly excellent examples. So thanks for the reference. Uh, I always uh, look forward to, to good readings. Um, I have to 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 think. So there's none. So it's not that I immediately think of five, and I just wonder about which one are the best two to suggest. Um, so I can think of a couple of debates also in the field of uh, economic uh, justice of assessments of the present. Um, so also in the contribution that international law 
trade law makes in perpetuating injustice or alleviating it. So there's a debate between um, uh, Thomas Poggi, Rob House, and uh, Ruti Titel on um, well, would the world have been better? Would the world be better without international trade law? Yeah. So because uh, there's a lot of international trade law bashing, and uh, so there's uh, uh, Rob House and Rudy Tatel actually take take that suggestion seriously and say, okay, let's play this through. What would be the case without international trade law? Yeah. So also in, in the assessments of the present, projections. No, I mean in the future. Yeah, I can't think of anything good other than to to, to, to tie it back to to the, the field that I that I that I see as I see it, uh, and to say that I mean they're all speculations about the future. Yeah? So I mean, if the international trade organization had been established in 1949, what would have happened would have been the alternative uh, future. But that's a bit of a cheap answer. I know that's not what you want to get at. But um, so I can't think of anything really good. Yeah, I think it, it seems like a really powerful. It seems like a powerful technique, and it's probably a technique uh, that does get used. It gets used in politics a lot, right? right? Yeah, no, in mo mo in, um, exactly. Yeah, in um, models of assessing, but alternative pol uh, politics of the present. Uh, yes, yeah, that's another use of, of counterfactuals. Yeah, but it's a, uh, many uses. Uh, so it's a different uh, different interest. So it's it wouldn't be. It wouldn't inform understandings of, of what has happened uh, or possibilities of the past. It wouldn't be geared towards gaining this, maybe regaining the sense of uh, possibilities uh, of the past. Uh, so yeah, it would be a bit of a different, different thing. Yeah, so there's yeah, probably some good uh, also science fiction that uh, takes off on counterfactuals. I'm Why not sure. Don't a little. I just actually read it, not with the counterfactual uh, mindset, actually. So what the the cloud not happening or what? Uh, no, um, no, but <laughs> can. Thanks. Okay. Um, okay. Well, please join me in, in thanking our speaker. Yeah. Thank you so much.